And again, welcome everyone. This is our next lecture in the series uh, Zapatai Physica. This is also a part of the Science Festival, which is taking place this week in Warsaw. And uh, our speaker today is Professor Kumbun Wafa from Harvard University, who is one of the leading figures in high energy theoretical physics and mathematical physics and string theory. He is also one of the leaders of the Center for the Fundamental Laws of Nature. And well, he's a very distinguished scientist. Let me just say that one of the most important recognitions for a scientist is when your name becomes a part of science. And Professor Wafa, his name is a part of several such uh, objects in science, like wafa witten theory or Gopakumar Wafa invariance or PCLV equations and uh, other equations. So this is just the manifestation that uh, he's one of the leaders in this field. He also got various important prizes, like the Dirac Medal or the Breakthrough Prize in Fundamental Physics. So we are happy to have him today. But let's welcome. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. It's a great pleasure uh, to be here and uh, to give a talk about my favorite subject, which is puzzles. And yes, we'll try to connect it to some things in physics and math, but the puzzle is my main interest. Uh, and actually, puzzle was my main interest when I was growing up uh, as a kid and also later in high school. And gradually, when I became more interested in physics and math, I tried to connect aspects of puzzles to things that I was learning in physics. And I found that a lot of the things that I find fun in puzzles is somehow reflected in laws that I learn in physics or some beautiful aspects of mathematics. So I hope to convey my excitement or enthusiasm about the, this connection between puzzles on the one hand and the deep relation between physics and mathematics. Needless to say, I'm not going to assume you have too much background in physics or math. So uh, if you find this too elementary, I, I apologize. So I'm, I'm gearing it dear to people who might be interested, perhaps you know, uh, early college students or late high school students. So for, uh, for others, I, I apologize in advance. But my aim is going to be just to have fun with puzzles. But before I do that, I perhaps should start by, uh, by saying just a few words about my area of research. So I'm going to start a little technical, so to speak. And then I'm going to basically go down, go back to the puzzle route. So my area of research is something called string theory. And the aim of this subject, string theory, is to unify fundamental forces and particles uh, into one framework. So to describe uh, physics in all scales is very difficult, because we know that the scales can be as small as 10 to the minus 34 centimeters. This is 0 0.00, a huge number of zeros, and then a 1. It's a very tiny scale. Or to talk about the whole entire universe, at least the observable part, which is like 10 to the power of 30 centimeters. So to talk about such a minuscule and vast scale at the same time, you better know what you're talking about. And string theory aims to do just that, to try to talk about all scales as small or as large as we can possibly observe. So the basic postulate of string theory is that the fundamental forces and fundamental particles describing these forces are not point-like like you would think about electrons or photons that you usually think as point-like, the fundamental entities in string theory are not point-like, but extended objects like a string, like a one-dimensional string, or sometimes even higher-dimensional membranes. So the basic ingredients of this theory are, are not particles. Of course, if you take a string and shrink it a little bit, it looks like a particle. Or if you have a membrane and just, just squeeze it a little bit, it looks like a particle. So we think particles like electrons and all that is like a squeezed version of these extended objects. So for example, if you talk about a, a proton, which is made of three quarks, we think about these quarks are actually, if you zoom in, instead of like point-like, you will find some structure like a string. Now, the reason we think this may be what's happening, you might think, why, do, why are we fancying extended objects? What's wrong with particles? What is wrong, it seems, that if you just insist on things being particles all the way down to a tiny scale, we get inconsistencies between the theory of gravity, Einstein's theory of gravity, and quantum mechanics, which is one of the major pillars of physics. So this ex replacing particles with extended objects resolves this discrepancy. 
Now, it turns out that this is a very mathematical area. Well, first of all, you're replacing point-like object with extended object, so there's some geometry involved in that. But actually, more than that, it turns out that the dimension of space, which we, we originally thought is three spatial dimensions and one time dimension, have to be higher. For example, it could be as, as much as nine spatial direction and one time directions. So you have six different directions, not just x, y, and z, but six more of those around. And, uh, and it turns out that these six directions, which are missing in our er everyday life, is not in contradiction with the fact that we haven't seen them if we take them to be tiny. So if an everyday experiment, an everyday that we do is if you assume that every point in space, there's a tiny space, six dimensional space that's hard to see because it's so tiny, then there's no contradiction with, with, with the string theory picture that is suggested. So that's how it's resolved. But then the strings and extended objects could wrap around different parts of this internal geometry and so then there's beautiful interplay between geometrical properties of this six-dimensional space and the particles we see around us, like electrons and quarks and so on, could be manifestations of different states of strings and the interplay of these membranes and others with this geometry. So there's a beautiful interplay between physics and mathematics going on precisely because there are extra dimensions in string theory. So these extra dimensions bring the game into full vast in terms of connecting these two areas together. So, so my aim in this talk is that this highly mathematical aspect of string theory, uh, which is uh, typical of string theory, is, is actually not new to string theory. We have a lot of examples in the past as well, perhaps beginning with the work of Newton's where the deep aspects of uh, physics and math got connected. The laws of mechanics got related to the development of calculus. And Maxwell's theory of electricity and magnetism got formulated in terms of differential calculus. Einstein's theory of relativity needed Riemannian geometry to be formulated. And the question that is my aim in this talk is can we see some aspect of these things in some simpler setup to just give, give, give aspects of this connection without getting entangled with complicated math. And as I will try to basically convince you that deep physical ideas in mathematics, at least some of it, and physics can be illustrated with puzzles. And in this talk, I'll illustrate this through a number of examples. And this is the math physics connection. So I will divide my talk into various subtopics. So I basically like a few topics. I go one by one over these topics to illustrate some of these, how, they how these ideas can be illustrated with puzzles, and what do they mean for physics? So the first thing I'm going to talk about is the connection between symmetry and conservation laws. Symmetry principles in physics turn out to be amazingly powerful. Now, you might think, well, what is symmetry? You just have a shape, it looks symmetric, so what? I mean, it doesn't sound like it's too exciting. Symmetry in physics has a deeper meaning than that. That's the starting point. But symmetry turns out to be related to conservation laws, that things don't change. Like, for example, the, the energy is conserved. The total energy is conserved in many situations that we know. And the amount of subject, some, 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 some stuff, if there's not doesn't decay or anything, is also conserved. So conservation of mass, conservation of object. And I want to illustrate this with some puzzle. So the next puzzle is going, the first puzzle is going to be the following. We have two uh, equal uh, containers of paint, one green and one white, equal in volume. So there's a symmetry between them, equality of volume. One is green, one is white. And we take a glass and fill it with the green paint. And pour it into the white one and stir it well. And take the same amount of liquid from now the mixture and put it back into the green paint, right? And stir it again. OK. Now, sounds like a boring thing, but now I have a question to ask you guys. The question I want to ask is, which container has the higher concentration of the other color? 
So I want to ask this. How many of you have, think that the green container has more white in it? Raise your hand. How many think the white has more green in it? Raise your hand. How many think they are equal? Don't also raise your hand. OK. OK, so I think it was divided mostly between the last two options, but more of you said that there is more green in the white than white in the green. And the intuition for that is very natural because you know, when, you put, you, when you took some container from the green and put it, I mean, when you took a glass from the green and put it into the white, it was pure green you put in. And then you mixed it, and then you took it from this mixture and put it back. So you didn't put pure white back. So it's natural to think that there is more green in here than the white. However, this turns out not to be true. You see, our intuition is misleading us. And what deconfuses us is symmetry and conservation loss. So I'll illustrate why symmetry principle and conservation loss solves this puzzle immediately. What is the symmetry? Well, the symmetry that there's a green and white equal amount of volume in the paints. That was the original symmetry situation. And the total volume doesn't change. Total volume of the green and the white at the beginning and at the end are the same. Right? OK. The volume of the green at the beginning and the volume of the mixtures at the end are equal because whatever total volume we put in the first, we took back again. So the total volume at the beginning and at the end are equal. OK? Is that, is that clear? Now, unmix them. Unmix them. What's going to happen? If you unmix them, you must have exactly the same amount of white as the green because the total volumes are equal. If you exchange them, you should get back. So there's no way one can be more than the other. Yeah, I know. It's confusing. It's confusing, but it is true. So let me try to explain it again. So it is very, very unintuitive, very unintuitive. So um, let, me just go, let me just go back to this one. Uh, the total volume at the end is equal to the beginning. So let's unmix them. Which one do you think is more, white or the green? They're equal. At the end? Yeah. yeah. They're equal. So at the end, it has to be equal because the total volume was the same. So if you switch them back, it better be the same. But to deconfuse us completely, we'll do the card version of this. Instead of having green things, let's just have a 10 red cards and 10 black cards. And then take a few from the red and put it into the black and then switch it back and see what happens. So we do the same thing. We take three red cards and put it in the black one. And then shuffle it. And then take three and put it back. Do you think the red has more black or the black has more red? Of course, the answer is that they are equal again. Because whatever is missing from the 10 cards you, you got better be the ones that's over there. So this completely deconfuses us. Is that clear? No, no, no puzzle whatsoever. But it shows us that thinking clearly about conservation law is powerful and deconfuses us. Now, let's go back a little bit in the time of Aristotle. Aristotle believed that heavier objects fall faster than light objects. This kind of intuition is obviously true by everybody who, who doesn't necessarily, uh, who's not necessarily a physicist. Your natural inclination is indeed a heavier object falls faster than the light object. A big, pe a, a big stone and a small pebble, you would think that a big stone will fall faster. It's kind of obvious, but actually it's not true. And Galileo believed and explained that all objects fall at the same rate. Ignoring the air resistance and all that, he argued that there is no difference between heavier and light objects. Now, this was very puzzling because, you know, how did he show it? He went and did experiments by actually trying it and dropping heavier and light objects from the same height at the same time and finding that they fall at the same rate. You would think that the scientists got convinced at that time. But no, scientists back then did not like experiments as much. Their thinking was, we don't soil our hands with experiments. Explain to me why they should fall at the same rate. It sounds so intuitively wrong that they fall at the same rate. 
that you better come up with a good explanation. I don't accept the experiment by itself. So Galileo had a harder time than just doing experiments. He had to explain why this is the case. And he came up with a beautiful conceptual explanation of this, which again uses symmetry. His argument was this. He thought, he thought what happens if you take three equal sized bricks and put it at the same height? Now, there's a translational symmetry in the horizontal direction because if you're at the same height above the Earth, there's no problem, there's no distinction between the, the points as far as the symmetry principles is concerned relative to the ground. So if you take three identical shape mass objects and put it at a given height and drop them at the same time, which one falls faster? Of course, what do you expect? Symmetry. By symmetry, they should all fall at the same rate, right? There's no puzzle there. Everybody says, yeah, yeah, that's boring. Move on, what else? Well, he said, what if you move them around a little bit? Does it matter if you move one of the bricks a little to the left or right at the same height and then release it? Well, why should it? It's a symmetry principle. No, of course it doesn't matter. And then he said, ah, but I can do a trick then. What if I connect the two and then drop it? Of course it doesn't matter, but now this is twice bigger than the other guy. So he deconfused the intuition that says the heavier object falls faster than the lighter object by doing this beautiful symmetry argument. So again, this kind of cleanses the mind and kind of simplifies the ideas. Physicists are very much fond of this kind of thinking. In other words, we don't just like to have laws and so on and complicated math describing them. We really want to have intuitively understanding it and perhaps correct our own intuition. We don't say necessarily our intuition is correct. We need to correct our intuition. And this is a very beautiful example of how you clean or correct your intuition. And that's very favorite of physicists to do this kind of thinking about, about uh, physical reality. So, so I talked about symmetry. But in fact, more interesting than symmetry is breaking it. You would think that physicists love symmetries. But in fact, actually, most physicists like breaking of the symmetries. Now, it's not because physicists have very strange uh, taste. We like symmetries that are broken by themselves, not that we break them by hand. In other words, we, want, we like spontaneous symmetry breaking. Now, what does a spontaneous symmetry breaking mean? So instead, to illustrate this, I will give you another puzzle. We have four towns, A, B, C, and D, on the corners of a square. And we are supposed to build a highway system connecting all four of these cities together. And we want to make sure that the cost is manageable, which means that we want to build a highway which is the minimal total length. Okay, So we want the minimal total length for this highway to connect all of them. It doesn't have to be that anyone gets directly connected to any other. As long as we can go from any city to any other city, we'll be fine. Is the question clear? OK, what is the best optimal path? How many think this is the best highway system? Raise your hand. OK. How many think this is a better one? OK. How many think this is, this is the better one? Or maybe this one doesn't matter. OK, now, you see, actually, it turns out that this is the best one. Now, this is bizarre, right? I mean, look at this. You connect them with 120 degree angles. These three angles are all 120. And this turns out to be the shortest uh, system. Why is that? Well, it turns out as it is. Now, why, is that, why does that bother us? Why is there something strange about this? The reason it's strange is that all these four cities were on the corners of a square. So for example, the distance of A to B is the same as A to C. But now, if you want to go from city A to city C, it's a shorter path than from A to B. So your symmetry has been broken. Even though you started with a situation which was perfectly symmetric between these four cities, between at least A, B, and A, C, you find that now the new highway system that is best you can do to minimize the length breaks the symmetry. Of course, you could say that you could have another highway system which goes like the other way, and A and B can be closer than A and C, 
But no matter which one you do, it does not give you a symmetric outcome between AB versus AC. Therefore, the symmetries of the square, for example, reflection about this axis has been broken by the highway system. This is what's called the spontaneous symmetry breaking. So sometimes we break symmetries in order to get optimal situations. So having an optimal situation is not necessarily meaning preserving a symmetry that you're starting with. This is what we are confused about. That's why uh, many people might think this is the actual answer because of symmetries. Your inclination naturally might lead you to say, oh, yeah, this is a symmetric situation. The answer better be symmetric. Or maybe this one. So these are the most natural guesses. Because of symmetry, you might think that these are the answer. Yet this is the answer. OK. Um, sorry? Yes, you can prove this. You can prove that it's either this one or the other version, where you can connect A and B together first, and then like this other one. So it's either this and that. This also might be familiar from the soap bubble geometry. That's 120 degree angles. So this is actually related to the same mechanism where the soap bubbles typically make, if they make uh, uh, connections between them, it's a 120 degree angle. So it's actually proven. Now, uh, let's again go back to Greeks. I really love these Greek philosophers. They really were ahead of their times. They actually had discovered back then, a few thousand years ago, that Earth is round. And there was simple geometry that showed them the shadow and the and a famous story about that, that, anyhow, they had figured out Earth was already round. And moreover, they thought, you know, Earth is round and spherical, so it must be at the center of the universe. Because they loved symmetry, in this case, Earth being spherical, they had discovered that. They thought it was natural then to assume that we are at the center of the universe. OK, that sounds like a good hypothesis. Why not? But then uh, they said, well, Earth is not moving. Of course, we know Earth is not moving. Look around you. And they knew that Earth is not moving. It was a sphere and the center of the universe. And it wasn't moving. At, at least at that time, it wasn't moving, they thought. But then they were, they were scientists. They were trying to explain why isn't the Earth moving. So they said, well, there's the Earth at the center of the universe. And it doesn't move because if it were to move in some direction, it breaks the symmetry. Because whichever way it goes, you say, why didn't it go the other way? Why this way? Why not this way? Because the spherical symmetry is not consistent with picking a direction. So they say symmetry prevents it from moving. That was their argument. So they were, they were really wed to the symmetry principle a lot. And they were using it this effectively to try to argue why the Earth is not moving. So they said it breaks symmetry. Therefore, it's not allowed. Isn't that amazing? But they were even smarter than that. Aristotle said, nope, I don't agree with this argument. Not a good argument. So what was Aristotle's problem with this argument? He said, um, who said the symmetric point is the best point? Why wouldn't you want to break the symmetry? He said, imagine you are in a place at the center of a circle. And everything is circular symmetric. And you have a food around you, a loaf of bread scattered on a circle around you. Like this. Do you think you're going to sit there forever and die? Or you're going to go and pick out one of these loaves of bread and eat and don't die out of hunger? His reasoning was, of course you're going to go and get that bread. You're not going to say, oh, if I go that way, I'm going to break the circular symmetry. You don't care. You're going to go and get food. It doesn't matter. You pick a direction. right? So he argued that who cares about symmetry if it breaking it is better than not breaking it? The optimal solution, even if you start with a symmetric situation, is not a symmetric outcome. You break it no matter what if you have to, and that's the outcome. You will, I guarantee that all of you would naturally break this with no problem. I would certainly break it too. No problem with that. In fact, uh, you know, it is actually quite interesting because the breaking of the symmetry is written on all of our bodies. Everybody here has the broken symmetry printed on us. Now you might say, what printed? Look, there's a rotational symmetry, horizontal rotational symmetry, approximate symmetry on the Earth, right? Now we have evolved in this system. And so therefore, we should have had a circular symmetry like this. That's a symmetry. But look, our eyes are in front, not around us like the circular symmetry, right? 
it look a little weird like this. Now, why did evolution choose the eyes to be in the front and not around us? Well, my, my reasoning is that uh, we needed to get the food. <laughs> we had to go and get the food. Who cares about all the food? We just get one food. It's having in the front is more effective than having in all directions. You have to go somewhere. So optimal solution is not having a circular eyes everywhere, but the eyes to where you're going to go. OK? So symmetry breaking is printed on us. It is part of us, and it's a good thing. It's how we actually get the optimal situation in many cases. In fact, uh, these examples are fun, but actually it's more deeper than that. The very fact that we can sit in this room right now and not go with the speed of light zooming around the universe is because of symmetry breaking. The reason is, it is one of the principles of modern physics that the reason particles have mass is because the symmetry has been spontaneously broken. Now, uh, the experiment done in the CERN actually, which discovered the Higgs particle, which is responsible for giving mass to everything, including us, electrons, protons, and all that, is because the symmetry is broken. And the way that happens is that there's a potential at every point in space. And if you were, the potential looks like this kind of a valley in some sense. And if you were at the top of this potential, you would have no mass. And if you move around, if the, if the corresponding object moves around to the sides, the mass will be proportional to how far away you are from the center. But since the minimum of the valley is not at the center, it turns out it wants to go away, and therefore things pick up mass. It doesn't matter where it goes, it has to go somewhere, and that is spontaneous symmetry breaking. So this idea of spontaneous symmetry breaking is related to why we exist as mass, have mass, and not being massless like a photon is. So we love symmetry breaking. That's how we can, we can walk and et cetera, et cetera. So we, we are happy with spontaneous symmetry breaking. So my next topic is unreasonable power of simple mathematics. So I want to say that don't think mathematics, if it's simple, is boring and useless. So I'm going to convince you that even you know, great elementary grade math is amazing in some ways. And I want to show you some simple example of that. Consider Earth and the equator. So this is the Earth, and the equator is this. Suppose you wrap a belt around the equator, and uh, you, you unwrap the belt. So it's a big, big belt. And you add just a tiny one meter to it. So you just add this little one meter over there. OK. And then what do you do? Well, you wrap it again around the Earth. But now this time, since you have added one meter, it's going to um, stand slightly above the Earth. Is that clear? Now my question to you, without doing any mathematics, I know you can all figure this out, but don't do mathematics. I just want you to guess. What, how much do you think this height is going to be? So in particular, how many of you think that you can pass a, a skyscraper from under that? Right, you cannot. How many think you can have a cat or a mouse going under it? Okay. How many think you can pass a piece of paper from under it? Okay. How many think it's less than a one tenth of a millimeter in, in, the, in the height? Okay. So now, good. So now let's do the computation and see what it is. Let's call this difference between the, this and how much it has risen above the Earth by x. It's a good starting point. Now, the radius of the Earth, let me call it by the symbol r, the radius. And we want to know what x is. Well, originally, the, the width of the belt, the, sorry, the circumference of the equator was 2 pi r, which means the length of the belt is 2 pi r. That's where we start. We add 1 meter. So the total new length, new length of the belt is 2 pi r plus 1. Now, that's going to be 2 pi times the new radius. The new radius is the old radius plus x. So 2 pi times the old radius plus x is 2 pi r plus 1. So as you can see, the 2 pi r's cancel from the both sides of this equation. Not a, not a very complicated math. 
but we can cancel it and you get 1 is 2 pi x. So you get x is 1 over 2 pi, which is about 0.16 centimeters, uh, meters or 16 centimeters. 16 centimeters is, is much bigger than what my, most of us would have thought. Okay? Now, why are we making this mistake? The reason we are making a mistake is that we think about intuitively in proportions. The Earth is huge. You know, one meter is tiny. And so relative to the Earth size, the amount that rises is small. So our intuition looks at scales relative to each other, naturally. And so the amount that it goes up compared to the radius of the Earth is much smaller than you might think. But, but since the radius of Earth is huge, 16 centimeters is minuscule. So that's a consistent answer. So that kind of is why we got confused. Now, some of you might have objected to this solution because why did I try to put it so uniformly about the Earth? I could have pulled one side, right? Suppose I pulled this out. So it could kind of be tight on one side and pull it one way. That one I can get more than 16 centimeter, right? Yes, does it make sense? I'm just saying we can pull one side and see how much we can pull. How many think you can pull it by half a meter? How many think can, you can do it by one meter? One meter. How many think can be doing it more like 120 meters? Right. OK, the answer turns out to be 121 meters. This is very unintuitive. You're adding one meter, and then you're pulling it, and it's 121 meters. The math involved in this involves a little bit calculus, so I won't do it. But it's not too complicated. And the, my main point is that relatively simple math, in this case, more than elementary school math, but some, some slightly more advanced, gives us answers which are shocking sometimes to questions like this. So, so math and doing math is kind of, is really the amazing thing, and we should take it very seriously in terms of applications to questions like this. In fact, mathematics has many different applications, and my, one of my favorite amazing aspects of mathematics is the fact, is a simple idea called continuity. You know, the functions you draw and so on are continuous. They don't jump around typically. So you just draw a nice curve. This, this is continuity. So mathematicians, you know, have formed this very precise meaning of what this means. And physicists intuitively deal with this situation all the time because, you know, the temperature gradually changes from one place to another or from one time to another. It doesn't jump around. And at least in most places, it's kind of smooth and nice and continuous. And this turns out to be a very powerful idea, the idea that things cannot jump around. And essentially, all laws of physics in some form have a continuity built into them. So um, let me illustrate this with the next puzzle. So again, we go back to the Earth and the equator. And we consider the temperature on the equator. The temperature on the equator, as you go around it, could change. It doesn't have to be the same. The question is, could it be that the temperature on two opposite, exactly opposite sides of the equator across from the center of the Earth be exactly equal? Of course, it can be, right? You can, for example, have temperatures constant. But the question I'm asking is, does it have to be? Does it have to be that there are always at least two points across the center of the Earth, diagonally opposite, which have exactly the same temperature? Yes? From what my math teacher told me, uh, if you imagine to swap those two points, I mean, rotate that uh, giant stick around uh, so that one is in the place of the other, and, uh, and et cetera, then uh, the points, if you imagine making a bar chart of both temperatures, uh, the, the lines will cross at some point. And that's the point when the temperatures of the both sides. Excellent. Yes, that's correct. So let's, let's, let's say what you just said. So consider the temperature opposite points from each other. And take the difference of the temperatures from one to the other. If this is 0, you're done, of course. If this is 0 for some angle, it's done. But it has a property that if you swap them, as you just said, the difference swaps to minus itself. So if you draw this function as a function of the angle, it starts from some value and it goes to minus itself as you go from 0 to pi. And therefore, there must be a point which it crosses 0 if it's continuous. So if you assume that temperature is a continuous function, it varies continuously, 
then it has to cross zero. And at the time that it crosses zero, the temperatures are equal. In fact, the more is true. Namely, not only temperature is the same, but actually you can find two points opposite to each other on the surface of the Earth for which not only the temperature, but also the pressures are equal. Now, if somebody said, you opened up the TV news say today, at every moment there was reported that the temperature and pressure on two opposite points were equal, you would have thought, wow, that's surprising. How could that possibly be? But it's just simple continuity argument. It turns out there's nothing deep in it other than using continuity, which itself is actually a deep principle. Okay, so these ideas in math are quite powerful. Actually, my favorite example of continuity is the following, is gravitational lensing. This is actually a little bit more abstract, so it's probably one the most abstract thing I'm going to tell you. So if you don't quite follow the argument, I apologize in advance, but I, I, I did like to mention it because you might think that all the applications are kind of simple or trivial, but this actually illustrates that they are not always that trivial. So let me try to explain it. What is gravitational lensing? Well, Einstein's theory of gravity basically is a geometric reformulation of gravity by saying that what happens when you have masses around is that this, this geometry of space gets curved. That is, the distance between points changes from what you might think. So you create a curvature in space and time when you put objects around. And when that happens, objects like light, which try to go shortest distance, since the space is curved, the shortest distance does not look like a straight line anymore. It's just kind of curvy. It goes over the path. So that's what Einstein, um, Einstein's theory predicts, and it has been verified to good accuracy today. So we believe in it. So you can, for example, you can have a light source like galaxies, and then you can get a light coming towards us in these paths. And it could happen occasionally that more than one light in two different paths come from the same object reaches us. So you can have the same point of that galaxy, for example, being reflected in two different ways. And so if that happens, you look from one side and the other side, you see the same object. So you get two images of the same object. And this has been observed. This is called gravitational lensing, because the, the gravity in the middle somehow causes this to curve. And that's why, why you're getting some kind of these multiple images. OK? That's, that's been observed. In fact, in this picture, in this region, there are objects which are repeated. They are the same objects. Which ones? It turns out that here, the blue circles are the same quasars, and the orange ones are the same galaxy. So you have three images of the same thing and the five images of the same thing. In that same picture, you might think they are different, but they are the same. We are being fooled by the image. OK. That's amazing. Fact. The number of gravitational images is always odd. Like either one image, three images, five images, seven images, etc. Wow, that's amazing. Why is it odd? And again, moreover, exactly less than half of them are inverted images. So you have. For example, if you have three images, one of them is inverted, two of them are upright. If you have five images, two of them are inverted, and three of them are upright. How do you show this? Well, you have to solve Einstein's equation. So we have to go to college and study it, well, maybe graduate school even, to study it. Not so. It just follows from continuity, I want trying to say. So I'm going to argue that this is just a fact about continuity which is manifestation of it, sounds extremely complicated. So how does that work? Well, first of all, I have to say that I'm assuming that new image gets, is getting blocked. Of course, if you have a light coming towards you and somebody puts some obstacle in the middle, you don't get any images. That zero image is not an odd number. So what I mean, I'm assuming that no light falls into anything. No, no, no light is blocked, so it can get to infinity with no problem. That's my assumption. So let's assume that the lights don't get blocked or they don't fall into a black hole or something. So let's assume that. Well, then the argument is the following. We consider the galaxy or whatever that star is, and we consider where we are. The light is coming from them to us. 
We imagine two spheres centered at where that star is. One sphere very close to that star. And one sphere, this gigantic sphere, to where we are, close to where we are, but still centered at that, at that, yeah, at that star. Is that clear? So just imagine two spheres, one very close to it and one very far from it. OK, is that clear? Imagining doesn't cost too much, so let's do that. Now, there is going to be the following. Every time the light goes from one, hits the sphere, it goes to some other point on the other sphere. So you get a map by following the light ray. Every point gets mapped to some point just by following the right. So literally, that map is following the light. So if there is nothing between them, if there is nothing between them, it's just going to be straight lines, right? So every point goes to some point. Now, mathematicians define what is called the degree of a map, which means, basically, you, you count how many points go to a given point. So if you have three different points on the first sphere go to one point, you say there are three pre-images. In, in this example, I had only one pre-image for every point. If you are here, how many points go to this one? Well, there's only one point, this guy. So you say the pre-image for this guy is just one point. But if there was another path which made it, then you could get more than one pre-image. So mathematicians show that the number of pre-images of a given point counted with plus and minus signs, depending on whether the map is inverted or not, as you go around the circle or the sphere, is always constant. It doesn't jump around. So if you started with a given degree, it always is the same. It's continuous. It doesn't jump. So if you consider the degree of the map from the sphere to the other sphere, when there is no matter, when there is no galaxy between them, it's degree one, because it just goes straight lines. Just like the picture I just showed here. This is degree one, because every image, every point has one pre-image exactly with the correct orientation. So the degree of this map is one. However, if you add matter in it, it doesn't have to remain one. It's only the net number of pre-images that's one, and therefore, if you have, let's say, three pre-images, two of them have to be plus sign and one have to be minus sign, so that plus one, plus one, minus one, it still adds up to one. So the degree does not change. Now, this sounds a little unintuitive still for people who are not familiar with degrees, but let me illustrate it with this image. Instead of imagining that the light rays bend around, we can imagine that the sphere bends around. It's equivalent to it. So instead, we can imagine the following. We can imagine the Earth here and add more matter, just add matter to the geometry, which somehow distorts the geometry of the circle to a geometry like this. And if you look at the light rays, you could have a situation like you have one pre-image, or just the straight lines now I'm taking, or two, three pre-images. And you see the signs different, because depending on which direction you go as you go around, you change the orientation of it, or five here. So you always get typically one, three, or five. Of course, there are some critical points where you're just about to jump from one to the other, but generically, you're just going to get odd numbers, and the orientation is going to flip from pluses to minuses. So the main point I'm trying to make here is that don't underestimate the power of continuity, because they can give you some very unintuitive results at the end, which can be understood from these simple arguments. So math is indeed very powerful. And Modern math has become extremely more powerful by considering this topological kind of way of thinking about things. So I want to go further with power of the mathematical abstraction. Abstraction is crucial for us in string theory. For us, the dimension of space is more than three. It is six more. So we have to understand this a bit more abstractly. And so uh, this is my main puzzle now. Consider these ants. OK.
So let me explain what the puzzle is. We have a bunch of ants. How many did we have? Let's start. Let's go back again. Let's see how many ants we have. We have four ants, and the ants are going at a constant velocity, each one. That means their direction is constant, and also their speed is constant. But their speed may be different from each other, but they're going in a particular direction. And every pair of them, not only their paths will cross because their directions are different, but they actually collide, all of them, except for the last pair, which we do not know. Question is, do this last pair also have to collide or not? That's the question. How many think the last pair should collide? Raise your hand. How many think they don't have to collide? Raise your hand. OK, so it's not completely obvious which one is the answer. It turns out that abstraction here helps you answer without doing any calculation. And the idea is adding extra dimensions. So this is a two-dimensional problem, it looks like, because the ants are moving on a plane. But there is also time in the story. And it turns out it's better to introduce an extra axis, which I will draw vertically, which is a time axis. So you have the plane and a time. As the ants are moving at a constant velocity, at each time, there are going to be different points. So if you plot where the ants are, they're going to be straight lines, because they're going at constant velocity. They're going to be straight lines in this three-dimensional space, the space of x, y, and a time. Is that clear? So constant velocity means straight lines. Ants path crossing doesn't mean that the lines in 3D will cross. They may not have to cross, because they all have to project down to that line. But if they actually collide, at the same time they're passing that point, which means the lines in that three dimension for the word line of each ant will have to cross as well. Is that clear? So the condition of collision is that the two lines are on the same plane. Is that clear? Now we can use three-dimensional geometry to solve the problem. You see, so we zoom out, we put the time, and the ants go their way. And then just, we just think about what's happening. As the ants collide, the ants 2 and 4, they form a plane here. As these collide, they form a plane. So this line and this plane are the same plane. And if you do a simple geometry, you find that these two have to be on the same plane. Therefore, they have to cross. So just the geometry of the plane will force it to cross. One of the most amazing discoveries in string theory is the discovery of what's called duality symmetries. Duality symmetry is kind of like art. It basically says that two very different looking things, systems that look very, very unsimilar, could nevertheless be identical. Somehow, we are not used to this, that things which look different are the same, but duality somehow makes that happen. And the best illustration I know of this is this drawing of Escher. So you see, if you look at this drawing, each corner something is going on here. You have this white sky and the black birds flying this way. Over here, you have this white birds flying uh, in the dark night sky. Down here, you have white and black fields and so on. Now, each corner, something else is going on, but kind of gradually melts from one to the other. So there's some kind of a duality going on where you change the perspective. The black bird here is becomes part of the night sky, and the white bird becomes part of the white bird becomes part of the white sky. And the fields, the black and white fields, get to be the black and white birds. This is what we found happening in string theory quite a lot, namely. If you look at one corner of this drawing, you would not have thought that this could be possibly part of this other drawing as well, because they look very different, but could gradually melt from one side to the other as you go from one side of this drawing to the other. So here is the next puzzle. I love the ants. So you just let's first watch of them. These ants are moving on a meter stick, and they just pass through each other nicely. No, no, they don't pass. They collide, you see? So let's do it again. Let's do this. This is a good picture. Let's just go back before we start. We have a meter stick. We have ants on it. One meter stick. Each ant is moving one centimeter per second. OK? All of them have the same speed. But you can set their directions any way you want. You can go to the left or to the right. When two ants 
come together, they collide, and reverse direction. Is that clear? OK. You are given 10 ants, or whatever number. Let's say 10 ants. And you put them on the meter stick. And your aim is to put them in such a place so that they collide as much as necessary, as long as possible, so that the last ant, before they fall off of the meter stick, before they get to the end of the meter stick and fall off, lasts the longest possible time. We want to maximize the time the last ant is on the meter stick. Is that clear, the question? OK? So let's watch the thing again. So these are colliding. So you want to perhaps try to arrange them to collide as much as possible so they kind of stuck on the middle somewhere. And they fall. Unfortunately, they fall off when they go. OK. So the question is, where do we put them so that we have the maximum time before the last ant is off the meter stick? I will, this one is hard to ask questions, so I'll just give you the answer. And the answer involves duality. Why duality? Well, because just imagine that as the ants collide and go back, etc., suppose you exchange the identity of the ants by a dual transformation. Just change what they were. So in other words, if an ant comes over here and collide, what if instead of colliding, what if they went through? Well, it looks the same if you didn't tag the ants, does it? So if you, in fact, make the ants all black. Are they actually colliding or just going through each other? <laughs> you wouldn't know. <laughs> There is no difference. So indeed, all you have to do is to put one ant at one corner, one side of the meter stick, and let them go. You don't care about the rest. OK, power of duality. You're just changing the perspective and giving a simple solution. Well, they will fall at some point. OK. Now, so. The, 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 the last puzzle I have here, this is my last one, is a reflection on scientific methodology. Scientists, what do they do? Well, they do experiments. They, they observe phenomena, they do experiments. They jot down the answers. They come and look at the answers, and they have an aha moment. They say, aha, this is what's going on. They write the formula which works. They do more experiments and make sure it works. They explain why it works. That's what understanding is called. They still do more experiments just to make sure there is no mistake. And that's the methodology of science. Is that clear? I want to illustrate this by an example of how we come up with examples, experiments, formula principles, and come up with arguments it works and how it works. Consider a circle and two points on it and connect them. How many regions do you get? Two, right? Two points, two regions. So we create our table. The scientists start writing up the results of experiments. Two points, two regions. Good. Now we go back to one more experiment. We put one more point. We connect all points. And we count the regions. Four regions. Good, the table is getting one more row. Three points, four regions. One more experiment. Let's do four points. Eight regions. Good. You get the pattern? Kind of? You're not convinced, huh? Let's do one more experiment then. Five points. 16 regions. OK? Two points, two regions, three points, four regions, four points, eight regions, five points, 16 regions. What's going on is kind of obvious, right? Each time you add a point, you double the number of regions. That's the formula, you think. And why does it double? You have to explain. It's not enough to come up with the answer. You have to explain. And you come up with a quick explanation as follows. Each time you connect two points, each region is either to its left or to its right, so it's a factor of two. In tagging each region, that's why it doubles. OK, so let's just make sure we didn't make any mistake. Let's do one more point, six points, and uh, we should get 32. Hmm, where's 32? 
Actually, it's 31. There's no mistake. That's the answer. We just made a mistake. The hypothesis that it doubles is incorrect. Sorry to shock you guys. <laughs> this is what happens to scientists all the time. We think we have figured out the phenomena. We do experiments. It looks good. We come up with the theorem, and we put our name onto the theorem. And later, we find it's not even true. OK? We get shocked, OK? But that's what experiment is all about. You check it, and you make sure. You don't, say, you don't stop experimenting in, in science. And we check it again and again in more different cases. Yes? Then there is a 32 between 26 and 27, because this is not numbered. There's no number? What do you mean? Between 26 and oh, 27. Oh, uh, there is, there's another number I'm missing. But anyhow, if you count, it's 31. It's not that. There's a mistake in <laughs> there's, there's Scientists make more, many mistakes, including drawing errors. <laughs> but believe me that if you do it correctly, and I encourage you to do it, you get 31, not 32. But thanks for pointing out. I'll fix it in my next. They're pointing out that this little yeah, one here is missing. Let's just see. Good point. Let's see. Who can figure out what's missing? Here's, where is 8? Here. 28, thank you. 28. Somebody figured it out. 28 is missing. That's where 28 should have been. Sorry about that. OK, so there's no, there's, I wasn't cheating you. Sorry. <laughs> <laughs> this scientist pulled a fast one on me. OK, no. It's <laughs> OK, so OK. The actual formula turns out to be this. The number of regions, R, is 1 plus n choose 2 plus n choose 4, where n is the number of uh, points. You see, if you had written 1 plus n choose 2 plus n choose 4 plus n choose 6 plus n choose 8 all the way up, this would be 2 to the power of n minus 1. But it stops here. And so up to n equals to 5, it's good. So up to n equals to 5, you get this power law. But after that, it just stops. And the next one, for example, would be 57, not 64. OK? That's how it is. So you see, math is fun. Puzzles are fun. But also it teaches us how we think about different things without you know, having, at the same time as having fun, it teaches us power, powerful things about our reality. I hope I have conveyed the power of simple mathematical ideas in the context of physics. Even the most ideas in string theory have simple mathematical underpinning. And we always like to understand things into its bare bones. And I hope that I've convinced you that uh, puzzles can play a great role in clarifying this. And thanks for listening to my talk. Hello. OK. Thanks again. So I think we have time for a few more questions or puzzles. I would like to ask, ask about strings. Uh, in one of your last papers, you conjectured uh, a theorem <laughs> about uh, the sitter vacua that yes. can exist in uh, string landscape. Uh, yes. Does this change anything in uh, our view on, of string theory as a consistent, correct uh, theory of quantum gravity? Yes. No, it doesn't change anything about string theory. It just hopefully it, it makes string theory observable, potentially. So it's, first of all, it's a conjecture. It could be wrong. There's, you know, these, I hope you see the example. Scientists are modest people. They make conjectures, and they're OK with being wrong. OK, that's part of our science. We don't, you know, it's not like I have proven this theorem. Like, you know, Pythagorean theorem is done once and for all. It's forever true. OK, no, not in science. Science, we are, we are trying to understand each time. So it's a conjecture, so it's not, it's not proven in any way. So we're just thinking that. And the idea here is that it's, there's a possibility that the dark energy around us is not constant. It could be changing in time. So most of the examples that we know of in string theory, almost all of the ones we really know, are actually changing in energy. They don't stay constant. Now, it could be that there are examples which is constant energy, which just we don't have a good way to think about them, and that's a possibility. But it could also be that the dark energy that we have along the, what's called the cosmological constant may not be constant. So, so we propose that there might be that scenario in string theory. It certainly, uh, I believe that string theory is the correct candidate for explaining quantum gravity. For sure, I wouldn't say that that's uh, inconsistent with experiments. Do we have any? Oops. 
do we have any observable evidence of string theory? Or is it just a beautiful concept? Right now, we have one, people usually kind of say there's one, one, ex, one concrete idea. Usually in physical theories, you put in some assumptions about what you have around. Like you have electric forces, you have gravitational forces, and all that. In string theory, you don't have to assume you have gravitational forces. It follows from string theory there's gravitational forces. That's a prediction. So if you drop this, it falls. That's an experiment. We just proved string theory. No, I'm just kidding. But it's an, it's an example of what kind of things we have done. However, to do more detailed check as we need to do, we need experiments which probe distances of the order of 10 to the minus 34 centimeters or so. We are not there experimentally. So to try to check string theory, we have to go to much higher energies and much shorter distances. And the, today's technology, unfortunately, does not make it available. So we don't have direct experimental, real direct experimental observation for string theory. This thing about dark energy, if it's true, will be one of the smoking guns for, potentially for string theory if it's observed. That's why I, we were excited with my colleagues to postulate that the dark energy might potentially be changing because they're actually measuring it now. And it's conceivable that they measure the dark energy changing. And so we would know that soon, hopefully, within the next four or five years. But we may be unlucky, and maybe that's not the going to connect with string theory. So we don't know at what point we will connect to string theory. But why we believe string theory is true if it's not a single experimental observation for it? It is because it has, it has theoretically connected so many different parts of physics together, and on top of it, to so many different areas of mathematics. It is hard to believe that such a structure has no good use in reality. So that's part of the motivation we have. And it is one theoretical aspect of it, which we have no other good candidate. It is the only real framework where the quantum theory and Einstein's general relativity have been unified into one, one object. That is not possible in any other method. And this is the most uh, elegant version that, that we can possibly could have had. So we, are, we cannot believe that that's just a random lot. But of course, we have to do experiments, and we don't know when that will happen. Uh, as you know very well, uh, string theory is not a theory, but a vast variety of theories. Uh, how do you determine for yourself uh, which questions are worth studying, uh, studying and which are not? What do you mean by variety of theories? I'm not sure I understand you. Uh, there are many string theories. Oh, you mean the five corners or whatever the corners of string theory, like M theory, uh, type 2A, type 2B, those? Uh, this is uh, just a particular example. Uh, this is a, a huge uh, field of doing, which provides m many theories, many models. Yes. And there is no, uh, as you just said, there is no hope for experimental verifications in, in, yeah, in our lives. No, I didn't so say that. I didn't quite say that. You're saying that. I hope that there is experimental verification in our lifetime. But it might be not directly going to that small energy, small distance, or high energy. There are other ways you can ask the question. So let me first of all answer your first part, which is, you see, look at this drawing, and different corners, different things are going on. So your question, analogous question in this drawing, is that where on this drawing do we live? Right? You could have had this corner, or that corner, or this corner, or that corner. It's possible. We don't know which corner we are at. That's what is called the string landscape. We have a landscape of possibilities. One of them is ours. There are a huge number of possibilities. That doesn't mean the theory is not useful or predictive. There are, there are possibilities, and there are not infinitely many consistent choices. There are finite many of them, but we don't know which one we are at. That's the first answer to your first question. The second one is that to directly observe string theory, to go into that short a distance might be impractical, as you say. But there are other potential connections, for example, like cosmology, like other ideas. Like, for example, early universe had a huge amount of energy. And it, it, as the universe expanded, it cools off. The structure of this cosmic microwave background radiation and its inhomogeneities might have, perchance, some imprint of the energies and the structure that was apparent at very high energies. And perhaps we can understand those and see some evidence for string theory. So I wouldn't be as gloomy as saying it's impossible that we will see it in our lifetime. It is not obvious that we will see it. But to say it, we cannot see it is a bit too strong a statement, I think. Nevertheless, I think that. Of course, we would have loved to see direct connection with experiments up to now already. String theory started a long time ago. 
early or late, late 1960s, and we don't have a still experimental evidence. So that's a long time that we haven't had, and we're still working on it. Why? Because it's so elegant and it's hard to believe it's not going to be connected in some form. So why a 9 plus 1 dimensions and not, no, let's say, 12 plus 1? Actually, I have a version which is 12 dimensional. I'm glad you raised it. No, <laughs> <laughs> no but, but more seriously, 9 plus 1 is very special, it turns out. And the reason for it is hard to explain not in a non-technical way, but let me try a little bit. 9 plus 1 turns out to be related to, well, it turns out it's more natural to think about 9 minus 1. Just for a second. So let's look at 8. Why is it 8 important? Well, 8 because string theory is one dimension and moves in time, so that's 2. So you subtract 2 from 10, it's 8. OK. Now, what is so special about 8? Eight? 8 turns out to be one of the most beautiful dimensions for the following reason. You see, uh, you can consider rotations. In three dimensions, you can rotate about x axis, y axis, z axis, and so on. So you're familiar with three dimensional rotation. You can do this rotation in any dimension, for example, in eight dimension. And it turns out the rotations in eight dimensions are particularly special because it has a property that if you take a vector and an object which is not quite a vector, which is called a spinner, they are actually have very similar properties. So without being able to tell you what that exact property is, I just want to say that eight dimensional rotations are special and that gets related to a symmetry called supersymmetry, which is crucial in string theory. And that's where 9 plus 1 comes in. So it's a mathematical connection. A mathematical property of rotations in 8 dimension is deeply connected to why string theories in 10 dimensions. Well, you see, 9 plus 1 is 8 plus 1 plus 1. <laughs> that you agree, I hope, right? 8 plus 1 plus 1, right? Now, why do I do 1 plus 1? Well, 1 plus 1 is because string is one dimensional. And it moves in time. So if you have a 10-dimensional space-time, the transverse direction of the string is 8-dimensional. So it's 2 plus 8. And the rotation involves transverse directions to the string. So that's why you get 8. Oh, excuse me. Uh, which fields of uh, mathematics here? Uh, which fields of mathematics do you uh, perceive as the, most, as the most promising in your research? Well, I have learned not to judge what part of math is interesting, because as I think I have figured it out, a new area of math comes in which is relevant. So I think basically all of math is going to be relevant in some form or another as far as I, I can see it. Perhaps the one direction which we have not as much application in physics, and I think we will see it, but we haven't, number theory, or deep problems in number theory have had not as much impact yet in string theory, but I suspect they will. They will have stronger impact, but they have had a minor connection right now. Deep connections between number theory. So an expert in number theory disagrees with me here, which is I'm glad to hear that, because I also, I also believe that number theory should have deep applications in physics, and it will have. But, but, but many other areas have had more clear connections, like differential geometry in the context of Einstein's theory, or um, you know, aspects of representation theory of Lie groups have had deep connections. So we have had some, something which have impacted more clearly. Some aspects of, of, uh, of mathematics which haven't shown up, it doesn't mean they will not show up. I believe they will. And the challenge just for us is to understand the deeper aspects of it. Hmm? Uh, so in today's lecture, we have seen a number of ways how to evolve our intuition through simple puzzles as well as uh, experiments. But uh, it, it, what about more complex models? What happens in studying the full models of physics that we get nonlinearities and they usually end up in chaotic behavior, even as simple as double pendulum. So some, at some point we're bound not to have a way to answer questions which we were able to answer for simple models. So how should we evolve and what should we do in the cases where chaos just uh, disturbs everything and makes everything almost random? I think the example you gave was a good example because it shows that the principle is simple. Manifestation could be complicated. So for us, Newton's law is perfectly simple. You can have complicated manifestation, even chaotic-like behavior, from simple-looking equations. Our task in science is to get the principles which are simple. In fact, it's beautiful to have complicated manifestation of simple principles like chaotic system. It doesn't mean that the law is chaotic. That's different. I would say that there's no problem with having a very simple law 
which has chaotic behavior in some particular cases. What's the problem? Okay, hi. Um, I have a question uh, here. Uh, today, earlier today, there was a proof, uh, like the proposed proof for Riemann's hypothesis. How do you think this will? I, I, I haven't studied it. I better not comment. I, I, oh, okay. I, there was a conference so here also. I can talk about the conference here. Okay, so you don't, don't know how this would affect uh, modern physics or string theory? Well, I, I would not rather talk about it whether or not there's a proof or not. I don't want to speculate. That's okay, not. okay. A moment before you speak about that, uh, uh, we have a simple laws, but uh, some of the spe special case of the simple laws could, could result in chaos. Simple, I can't hear. Simple what? I mean, just a moment before you just said about chaos, right? So, yes. So we, we could have the simple laws, but uh, some of the specific case of the simple laws could result in chaos. Yes. And we, we, sh we shouldn't be bothered about that, but I think, we, uh, I mean, my personal opinion that, uh, I mean, or I think that because eventually what's happening in the world around is like some sort of uh, cumulative effect of these small things and understanding chaos, I mean, and how they, like one system having chaos and there's another system having chaos and how they're interacting with each other and creating a bigger, much more complex system. So yes. I think it's pretty necessary to uh, understand uh, chaos. Ch yeah. I didn't say we should not understand chaos. I didn't say that chaos is, is a useless thing to do. For sure not. In fact, it's been studied by both physicists and mathematicians. It's a very beautiful subject. No, what I meant here was that we shouldn't be saying, oh, God, chaos. I don't like this science. This is useless. It's chaos. No, no, no. The principle should be simple. It could have chaotic manifestation, and you can have exponents of how quickly the chaos sets in, what properties it has. There are connections with black holes and chaos and so on. People are studying this left and right in physics and math. That's a perfectly natural question. There's nothing wrong with chaos. We study it. And in fact, look around us in politics today. <laughs> no, I'm just kidding. Well, the particles in general situations do not necessarily have to have chaotic behavior. There are examples where you have chaotic behavior. If you have gone to a physics lab where they have the spectral lines of hydrogen, for example, if you have a hydrogen lamp, and you look at the spectrum of it, you see these amazingly nice lines, very, very patterned, beautiful. Why? Simple laws. Quantum mechanics, chaotic. you might think it's chaotic at the scale of atoms and electrons, but it's not. You write the equation, it works out beautifully. Now, it doesn't mean that you cannot arrange a situation where it leads to chaotic behavior even in that context. But to say that there is no law that you can see just because it's small, that's not true. Atoms is a beautiful manifestation of that. Yeah, just one more question. Uh, as we know, there are many approaches and interpretation of uh, quantum mechanics. I'm talking about, for instance, uh, the classical Copenhagen interpretation or the Everett's uh, many words. My question is, uh, which do you think is uh, correct and why? Well, I don't think we have really understood experimentation clearly yet in quantum mechanics. We have models for them. I don't think any of them is totally satisfactory to me. And I think some physicists share my view, some people don't. But it doesn't mean that I have a better theory. I mean, for me, quantum mechanics works. And as a practical matter, what you do to compute things makes sense. But I don't feel we have got to the bottom of the meaning of experiments yet. So, that is one of the enigmas of quantum mechanics. I don't think it is quite, I, I, would, I would not say that there's nothing to be done there. It's, it's still open in terms of understanding, and there are different interpretations. It doesn't change practically what we do in experiments and how we read what the consequence of quantum mechanics is in specific experiments. So it's in some sense a little philosophical, a little bit right now. But I think there's also a meaning to what the actual experiment means, which has still to be fleshed out. In my opinion, the, the, the verdict has not, is not final yet. So maybe one last question. Yes. Who started a string theory idea? Who started it? Well, uh, perhaps I should say first how it was started, and then I will say who it was started. Uh, originally, around 19, I think 68 or so, somebody was trying to understand what they were seeing in experiments in particle collisions. And the experiments they were doing showed that if two particles collide this way, 
it is somehow related to this one particle colliding backwards with itself. So it has some bizarre property. And he just wrote down a formula for what that kind of interaction could be like. So he wrote down a mathematical formula, not physics, just a math formula, which had this funny symmetry. So the symmetry principle led him to write a math formula. He was not talking about string theory. He was talking about the math formula, which had the symmetry property. Later, physicists asked, hmm, what kind of a scattering of which particles could this be? And they argued that there's no particle which can have this kind of scattering. And somebody figured out that the only way you can get this is if you talk about strings. And then they started writing strings and say, oh, no, 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 this doesn't work for particles. Because it has a particle which has massless spin two particles. And that only is true if you have gravity in the game, graviton. But they were not talking about gravitational scatterings in the experiments. So they said, this is no good for the labs. But somebody says, who cares about the labs? We are talking about gravitons. It's the quantum theory of gravity. So it's gradually it evolved to be what it is, unifying Einstein's theory of gravity and quantum mechanics. It was originally designed to answer a different question, which it didn't answer at that time. And this was in 1968 by Veneziano. So the, very, the way it came about is actually a lesson to us that good ideas, symmetries, could lead somewhere good, even though it's not necessarily where you thought they would be applied to. All right, so let us thank the speaker again. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.